Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Those things that we want, those blessings, the promises of God, in their fullness, we will not receive them until we enter in to God's kingdom. Now, that does not mean that God does not bless now in this world at this time. Obviously, he does, and he does so graciously and abundantly. But realize the full measure of his goodness, the degree that he has promised things according to his covenantal responsibilities, those promises, those blessings in their actuality will not be received by us to the degree that God has promised until his kingdom comes. Let me say it another way. Until after God's judgment. God's judgment for those who are in a covenantal relationship with him. His judgment leads to good things. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 25. The book of Isaiah and chapter 25. Now, we have seen that Isaiah, this prophet that speaks of the salvation of the Lord, that's what his name means. He has said chapter after chapter that God's judgment is coming. It is a harsh judgment and it will destroy, but after this destruction, God will rebuild. He will build up and he will establish those promises, those blessings, all of that within a kingdom context. And again, in this 25th chapter, it is exactly what we see. So it's a short chapter, but it is a meaningful chapter. Look to, with me to verse 1. Isaiah 25 and verse 1. The Lord my God are you. Now here Isaiah is prophesying, but he's doing so in a very personal way. He is acknowledging this Lord, the only Lord God, as his God. And in doing so, we're going to see some of the benefits and the character of God and how his character, his righteousness, his justice, his holiness, how these things are, are manifested when God's throne moves from the heavens towards earth. This is what we're speaking about. So we read, the Lord my God are you. Now, after making that declaration, we could say a statement of faith, what does Isaiah do? He now speaks about his response to the fact that he knows God. God has been revealed to him. He has experienced God. And this causes him, notice what he says. You, O Lord, are, are my God. Therefore, he says, I will exalt you. I give thanks or I will give thanks. A kingdom message not to your name, but of your name. Now, the difference here is that the preposition is not in this verse. And therefore, it's not that he gives thanks to. He's giving thanks of the character of God, meaning this. He recognizes God's character. Now, the reason why I say character is we have your name, meaning your name, O God. And because of God's character, Isaiah, who has come to recognize, to know God, he exalts him and he gives thanks. And this word for giving thanks can also be a confession, an acknowledgement 
of the goodness of God's character. For you have done, and the next word is Pele, which is wondrously, marvelously, and it foreshadows what we're going to see at the end of this chapter. How God has in the past, present, and especially in the future, that God is going to manifest his wonders, his marvelous things that all are within the context of his covenantal promises. And that's why it's so important that we make sure that we're in that covenantal relationship. And when I speak of a covenant, I'm speaking about Habrit HaChadasha, the new covenant. This new covenant which was ratified and put into power by the blood of Messiah Yeshua. We read that you have done marvelously, wondrously, and then it speaks about a word that, that if we just translate it simply, it's a word, etza, but it's in the plural, so it's atzot, which is counsels. Now, what it's referring to is God's uh, blueprints for the future. We could think of it as simply the tochniot, the plans of God. And God has made these plans from when? From long ago. And we have here the word which means something which is far, far away, something which is distant. He made these promises, these, these programs for his creation. He did so long ago. And then we have uh, two words, two words that in this first verse, the word imuna, which is simply word faith. And it speaks, some would say, about what our response should be to God's plans and his purposes. We need to respond to them with faith, in faith. And then the last word is omen, and it's a word that speaks of truth. It speaks of an agreement with God. It's that same word in a different uh, vowel construction, but the same three letters, for the word amen so it speaks and by the word faith derives itself from the same word so faithful and true we might say should be our response to god's whose programs and promises and purposes they which he revealed long ago through his word and even before the revelation of his word, he knew them always. There was never a time that God did not know them. And now he is going to manifest them, put them into place as an outcome of his judgment. Let's look at verse 2. For you have set a city to a heap. Now, this word set can also be uh, placed or, in this context, made. And it's interesting because we have one letter that's before the word for city. And it's a word for the letter that relates to the phrase from. And it speaks about a city being something, but it's no longer. It was moved from that, that status, that condition, that, that way into something else and what did god make this city no longer it's from a city but it's simply the word for a heap or a pile and we're going to see that he does that pay close attention it also says kiria vitsura which is another word for a city and after that we have an adjective for a fortified a strong a powerful city and he uses a different word it's a word for same word for like a waterfall meaning brought down causing it to collapse making it fall so we have a heap but also the word for just ruins destruction and God is going to do that to all that stands in opposition to him that's what this passage of scripture is going to reveal to us also a palace of foreigners. And this speaks about 
those that are outside of Israel, those who are enjoying the finer things that this world has to offer, those who have no covenantal relationship with God, they dwell in this context in a armon, a palace. And it's really speaking about a city being a palace type city, a compound for these uh, covenant, covenant people without a covenant. It says they might be a, a fortified city. They may be a palace, but God says here that, that they are going to be no more in that condition, and they will not be, end of verse 2, lo yibane, they will not be built. So they may have made the glorious things within the human power and intellect and capabilities but God is going to destroy them and they shall be no more no opportunity no second chances here when God's judgment in this context happens that which man saw as as good precious desirable these things will be no more they will not be built again verse 3 Therefore, now this is the response of those who witness God's judgment and survive. We're speaking here about a remnant. And notice what it says. Therefore, a, a strong or powerful people, they will honor you. Even though that they have strength, power, resources, this word means all of that. They are not going to rest, rely, trust, depend upon themselves or upon what they possess, but they are going to make a wise decision as witnessing God's judgment. They are going to respond by, by honoring or glorifying you. And then he says another word for a city, a city of, we might say, ruthless nations or Gentiles, these that have no faith in God. It says, this city of ruthless nations, what's going to happen to them? As an outcome of witnessing God's judgment, there's going to be a transformation. These who are without a relationship, those who are uninterested, those who practice, and the word here, is the modern Hebrew word for tyranny. Those that enslave, those that punish, those that oppress. What are they going to do? They are going to be changed as an outcome of witnessing God's judgment. And it says here that they are going to fear you. Verse 4. For you have become. Now it's speaking about God. Having become a, a stronghold for the one who is meager, the one who is, and this means exceedingly poor. You have become a stronghold for, and it's another word, a synonym for someone who has little, poor, destitute. And it speaks of God being this stronghold, this refuge for such a one in his time of trouble. He also says that you are a shelter from the storm you are a a shade against the the heat the hot weather and then it says for the breath now this is probably a word that refers to their their spirit of tyranny their threats that they speak forth we know the expression to breathe threats when we speak we know that air is is pushed forth from our mouth and that word for air or breath can be the same word ruach for spirit so it speaks about how they were one of tyranny and what is God going to do well to such a one it says they are going to be of no power no problem for God they are going to be like a rain that that beats against the wall so rain, it may be a strong rain, but that rain won't have any 
impression, any outcome, any bring, any change to that wall. And that's what God's saying. In the end, those who have strong strength, those who are, are full of oppression, they are not going to have any status when God uh, puts forth puts forth his judgment. Look now to verse 5. As, and it's the second time that this word appears for, for heat, and it's a word of, of being arid, dry, and very, very hot. And it says here that, that a place that is arid, dry, like a desert, heat doesn't bother those, those locations. And then it speaks about the noise or the uprising of these same individuals. It's a word for a foreigner, but it means one that has no covenantal relationship with God. What is God going to do to such a one? We read here that God is going to make them submit or subdue them. Now, it may be a word that speaks about a change, or it may simply be a word that God's going to conquer them and subdue them. Again, we have that same word for heat, a dry place, heat, but God is like a a cloud. And this is a word for a thick cloud that provides shade. Likewise, the, the song of the tyrants. What is God going to do? He is going to respond to them. There's going to be an answer to them from God, and that answer is his judgment. So when we look at this passage, we see how God is going to bring great change to this world, a change that if you are desiring righteousness, holiness, morality, justice, then God's judgment is going to be of interest to you. And that's why it's so disappointing today that people don't teach on God's judgment. They don't want to mention it. They think that it's maybe just done away with and no more. That's simply an Old Testament view. But when we look at what the Word of God teaches, God's judgment, Messiah taught taught thoroughly and frequently on this concept because he spoke about the establishment of the kingdom of God. Look now to verse 6. Now, in verse 6, this second part of Isaiah 25, there's a location that's going to be to be emphasized. And that location is this mountain. And what is this mountain? Well, many believe that this speaks about the mountain of the Lord, the temple mount, the place that Messiah, King Messiah, is going to rule from. And that rule of righteousness, justice, and peace only will be established as an outcome from God's judgment. So notice what it says here, verse verse 6. The Lord of hosts, he has done to all the people on this mountain. So it speaks about what God literally is going to do. Now, it puts it in a a a construction, but when we pay close attention to it, it is futuristic. So the Lord of hosts, he will do to all people on this mountain. And what's he going to do? Well, this word, la sot, in its base form, can mean to do or make. So God is going to make where? This Lord of hosts. And this word, Lord of hosts, speaks about his power, his strength, his sovereignty to bring into effect what he says. These counsels of old, these programs and purposes of God that he deemed long ago, He's going to bring them into reality. And he's going to do that through his rule. And that's why it says, Behar Hazay, on this mountain. For, for those who are in a covenant, notice what it says. Mishte Shmanim. Mishte Shmarim. Now, Shmanim comes from the Hebrew word. It can mean oil, but it can also mean the, the 
fat or the choice parts, the best aspects of, of usually food. So it's the choice pieces of food, and we have the word for shmarim. And this, most of the rabbinical scholars say it's referring to wine. So God is going to, on his mountain, as an outcome, and, and some will say this is reminiscent to the great wedding banquet that, that Revelation chapter 19 speaks of, also as an outcome of God's judgment. So John and Isaiah agree. So a, a feasting, a banquet of the best foods, a banquet of the best wines. And then we have this word shman, shmanim, again with a word that I think many of the English Bibles translated uh, morrow. But again, it's speaking about that which is prepared in a delicate, in a a careful manner and then we have wine mentioned and it's a word in modern hebrew for refining like oil it goes through a process so it can be used to its fullest potential and that's what it's saying here about wine now wine in the scripture is synonymous with joy so god is promising here through his rule and why do i say rule on his mountain he is going to make a festival a banquet a feast the word is mishte and there it's going to consist of the choice foods that have been prepared specially and the wines that have been produced for the purpose of joy in an exceedingly great manner that's god verse 7 it says and he will swallow, where? And this is a word for bringing about a change. It's literally the word swallow, but it can be in reference to judgment or that which is consumed, that which is done away with, but the emphasis is a change. And he will swallow on that mountain. He will devour, he will bring to an end. Paneha lot. Now, this is the face of a covering. Now, it's interesting because if you do much research, and, and I spent a lot of time going through and tracing words and seeing what many of the ancient sages said about these words through some resources. And what they were saying is that God is removing a covering, a covering, kind of a veil that, that keeps us from seeing, beholding, understanding the, the essence of, of God's glory. Now, obviously, we'll never know everything, but, but it speaks about a change where the glory of God is going to be manifested in a greater way in that kingdom than right now. So it's a removal of that covering. He also says the covering upon all peoples and the covering that was poured out upon all nations. So it speaks about something that, that the nations, the world, that humanity had in common. And that is this separation, this distance, this hiding of, of God's presence. But through God's judgment, on that mountain when he rules, there is going to be a removal of that covering, that veil, that, that, that camouflage that hid God from us. So it's another emphasis of the blessings that come about through the rule of God. Verse 8. Verse 8 has this same word for swallow, to, to destroy. It's a word of transition or change in this context. And notice what God's going to do. It says here, at this time under his rule, so it's as though he's already done it, it's future for us, but from this context, he has swallowed up, he has devoured 
death forever. The Lord God has wiped away the tear from upon every face. And every face, obviously we're speaking about those who are in the kingdom, who have a covenantal relationship, who have received God's grace, his redemption, and now have that eternal relationship with him. What is God going to do? He is going to devour. He is going to destroy death forever. He is going to wipe away every tear from all the faces. And the end of verse 8 says, and the contempt, the reproach, the, the shame of his people, he will remove from all the earth. For the Lord, he has spoken. And his people here, it's the covenant people, those who are in that new covenantal relationship because, and hear this very carefully, no one, and I mean that very strongly, no one will be into the kingdom of God without having established that new covenant relationship through Messiah. And that is established by faith in the grace of God in the sufficiency of the work of Messiah. And therefore, God is going to destroy death. He is going to wipe away every tear. And he says here that the shame the disgrace of his covenant people he will remove from all the earth. And the Lord has spoken. It is a term of promise. Verse 9. Now, verse 9 gives us the clearest indication that indeed we're talking about the last days. That this is not speaking about something that has happened, but will happen. And one of the clues, and I've talked about this frequently because this expression appears frequently in the word of God. Hopefully by now you know it, you can translate it when you hear it in Hebrew, Yom ha hu, on that day. That day is judgment day that, that gives way to the kingdom of God. And he said on that day, behold, behold our God. This is the one that we have hoped for. He is our Savior. This is the Lord. We have hoped for Him. Let us rejoice and be glad in, and notice this last word, in His salvation. It's His salvation that He can share. Beautiful scripture. And He will say on that day, Behold our God, this is the one. We hope for Him. He is our Savior. This is the Lord. We have hope for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And this word, Yeshua, not Yeshua, that's the name for Messiah, but Yeshua, it speaks of victory, a kingdom victory, the outcome of overcoming the enemy through the grace of God, the work of God, the victory that God bestows upon us. Verse 10, now we see God, having done all these things, we see his authority. Emphasize, verse 10, for the hand of the Lord, he will rest, where? On this mountain. And again, hand speaks about power, strength, ability, but also authority. So God's authority it will have implications for all of his creation, but the center of his rule is this mountain. And obviously, we're speaking about Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And, and one of the things that is so disappointing is how, and this is becoming more frequently taught in seminaries and Bible colleges in, in Europe, in the United States and throughout the world. And that is simply that Jerusalem, there's no more significance of that place. We're, we're not thinking about some, some piece of land. Well, the problem is that is in conflict with the word of God. Jerusalem, think about 
the psalm. Jerusalem, if I forget you, may my right hand forget its skill. We need to be people that understand not just the significance of Jerusalem in the past, but the significance, the great significance, the greater significance of Jerusalem for the future. And not only am I speaking about the millennial kingdom, where, in my opinion, this has a lot of reference to, but also, also the new Jerusalem, that final state, that last condition, eternal condition of the kingdom of God. It's known by the name, the new Jerusalem. Verse 10, for the hand of the Lord, it will rest on this mountain. And notice what he's going to do. One of the enemies of Israel that tried to prohibit Israel from entering into the land. And we see parallelism. Israel entering into the land is a a picture of God's covenant people, the new covenant people, entering into the kingdom of God. And Moab wanted to prohibit that. And this is why they're mentioned. It says, and Moab will be treaded down under him as one treads hay in the midst of, and the word here is a a dung heap, manure. Now, I have not spent much time on a farm, but I've been on a farm. And, And you'll see oftentimes that there's places where they put the, the manure for the, the, from the animals or for fertilizer they're going to use, and there's hay in there. And it's just stepped on, tracked in. No one pays any attention. That hay has no significance whatsoever. And that's what it's saying here about Moab, and we need to understand it as a reference to all, all people, all nations that try to prohibit, that try to thwart those purposes, those plans of God. What we talked about earlier when it spoke about the atzot, me rachok, these plans, these counsels of God, which are purposes that will be fulfilled. So Moab is going to be be tread under his feet as one treads hay in the midst of a dunghill. Verse 11. He will spread forth his hands in its midst. Now, this could be the midst of the mountain or the midst of his people, but God will spread forth his hands as the swimmer spreads forth in order to swim. And what we see here, when you check out some of the the better commentators, what they'll tell you is this. Someone who is swimming and spreads out his hands, he does so, in a specific manner, for a specific purpose, in order to achieve, arrive at a specific location. And this is what God's doing. God is moving. He is going to utilize his authority, hand, authority, power, in order to achieve, to arrive at a specific purpose, condition, plan, location. And this all is a reference to his kingdom purposes and what's he going to do well in doing so he is and it's another reference to judgment he will make low and this can be the word for to humble he will humble or make low the pride him who has pride with and this is a word many of your bibles will say the trickery of his hand But if you do a a good study of this word, it's the same word for setting an ambush. And an ambush surprises. A ambush captures one off guard. So it's not really trickery, but it's the fact that those in the last days, God is going to move his hand, utilize his power and authority And it is going to be like an ambush upon those who are prideful. And therefore, look at the last verse, verse 12. Now, there's three words here. The word for a fortress. 
a word for the walls of that fortress and the adjective for that which is uh, lifted up, elevated. So he says, the walls, your walls of this elevated fortress, what is he going to do? He is going to, or it's in the past tense, he has brought down. He has humbled it, that same word earlier, made low. He has brought it down. So all the attempts by humanity in order to resist God and war against God and try to prohibit what he wants, all of that is futile. God is going to bring down the walls. The walls are the security, the walls of this elevated fortress. He is going to bring it down. He is going to humble it, make it low. And then notice the last part. He arts ad afar. He will bring it down. It will arrive at the ground, literally on earth, even unto, and this is a word for, for dirt or the ground or the dust. So what we find here is this. God is going to, for those who have no covenantal relationship, they are going to return to dust. That's their physical bodies. But their souls are going to experience the eternal condemnation of the wrath of God. But those who have a covenantal relationship, we are going to enjoy God's love, his presence, that veil of separation is going to be removed so that we can have those choice benefits, these fine wine, that great joy. Where? In that eternal kingdom. Being a recipient of the covenantal promises of God, his blessings. So again, we see the relationship about how God's judgment in the last days for those who trust in him through a covenant, that judgment is going to bring about a glorious transformation whereby they experience the promises of God for eternity. Well, we'll stop with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.